Yeah. <ríe> Hola, ¿cómo están? Oigan, eh, mi charla va a ser en inglés y en español, no porque me crea mucho, pero porque esta charla yo ya la he dado antes y mucha gente, y no, no hubo video, y mucha gente me, me ha pedido, mucha gente del internet que habla diferentes idiomas, entonces yo creo que por el valor que puede tener, modestia, eh, creo que vale la pena hacerla en inglés, pero de pronto siempre he querido decir cosas en español cuando voy muy rápido en mi cabeza y mi boca no, no, no alcanza. Entonces, va a ser en Spanglish porque puedo y porque estoy en ScaleConf y pues bueno, si no les gusta, pues ni modo. <coughs> ok. So, who am I? I am Veronica Lopez. I am Mexican and I work as a software engineer in Red Hat formerly at Coros. Well, I'm at a Coros team formerly and then we got acquired by Red Hat. And formerly I used to do a little bit of physics, which then I, I didn't abandon physics because I wanted or because I couldn't continue, but because I wanted to learn more and Uh, the means of learning more for me represented going to computer science, but that's another story. Um, I have always been, uh, I have loved all my life to go to school. Like, <laughs> if someone could pay me to go to school every day, I would, like, without working, without anything else. So, uh, thanks to this, I enjoy, like, being around academic people and, and learning about academia in general, and I have been a researcher in my former life. So I'm constantly trying to make both things work, like because a lot of times there are papers that are really impressive, both in physics and in computer science, but that don't necessarily apply or are, or are very, very hard to apply in real life because nobody has time or, or the resources needed to apply them. And well, as a personal effort, I am continuously trying to make computers and science converge. So it is very important to know that I am made in Mexico because please don't allow anyone as a South American tell you that you're not good enough like in working with people around the world or with people that not necessarily look like us. So I just want to tell you that even though I have been working with people from other cultures <laughs> for quite a long time, 90% of the knowledge that I have gotten was acquired in Latin America, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, first of all, well, this is sort of the agenda for today. So, um, my passion for, well, it's not passion, it's curiosity for scale and distributed systems come from, non, from a non-nerd approach, okay? So when I was a little kid, um, my family has like a trading business of like fruit and well, uh, produce. So they used to have a, they used to own a, a, an apple field. So my mom and I one day visited and my mom decided to take an apple from a tree. And then one of the workers immediately like took her hand and she was like, why? I mean, this is my own field, like why? Why are you trying to stop me from eating an apple? And well, first of all, the worker was not aware that my mom was the owner, but not, not only that, like he told her, well, the thing is that you can eat an apple, but imagine that everybody that comes here grabs an apple from a tree. Then we would be out of business very soon because like one apple doesn't matter, but at scale, it really matters, right? So ever since, I don't remember how old I was, but maybe I was like seven or eight. So ever since I have thought about the impact of the scale of things, right? Like what would happen if this little thing would become like bigger? So that of course was like, that resonated with me once I went to computer science because it was exactly how my mind worked. So we're going to revisit a little bit of graph theory and topology. I know that this is the last talk of the day, so I won't <laughs> give you a hard time with this, but well. Uh, a lot of people always ask me, like, what good does being good at math, or at least understanding basics of math, 
does for your computer science career or your career as a programmer? And what if I'm not good at math? So a lot of people always tell you like, oh, because if you're smart enough for math, then you will be smart enough for everything. Or because it makes you analyze things better or things like that. But like today, I'm not talking about that. Today, I'm talking about concrete things that will make you better at your programming job and in, for the industry. And they're not tips. They're like specific um, strategies and, and things from the academia and math and, well, academia academic computer science that can be applied into the industry. So uh, let's see, for example, um, like Elizabeth talk last um, the last session, well, in yesterday, uh, she mentioned a lot about uh, linear algebra, which is super, super useful in very specific ways. Like, for example, if you're a game developer, you would be super good um, using uh, linear algebra. And here are some examples of different levels of how we can apply math and science into our programs. But today I'm focusing on the general approach, like graph theory and topology. So before, as I said, I have been iterating uh, between the industry and, and academia for a very long time, uh, as much as I can. So uh, in my last attempt to go back to the academia, I actually found a way to implement what I knew into the uh, industry. So uh, here, like this presentation is sort of like, um, the, the presentation, the culmination of uh, research that I did for my postgraduate studies. So all of these concepts, like graph theory, topology, and distributed systems, have something in common, the connectivity, the concept of connectivity that will be very useful throughout um, all of the talk. So first of all, uh, who here is not familiar with what a distributed system is? ¿Quién aquí no sabe qué es un sistema distribuido? ¿O quién nunca ha trabajado con un sistema distribuido? A todos, muy bien. <laughs> okay, so here's this famous and overused quote about distributed systems by Leslie Lamport, which, it, which says something like, distributed systems is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. So I want no, no voy a profundizar más porque está en todos lados, pero bueno, eh, si ustedes quieren tener un sistema distribuido así, top shape, van a, van a querer tener todas estas cosas, ¿no? Así que sea fault tolerant, highly available, recoverable, consistent, secure, scalable, etc. You would never have all of this at the same time. Like, consider you, yourself lucky if you have like three at the same time or whatever. But, well, that is the unicorn. And, well, uh, since uh, programming at scale, it, it doesn't matter how much you test, how, how straight a programmer you are, how smart you are, a lot of things that you cannot control come into, into mind. So for me, right now, that can go wrong. So the best thing that you can do is not to, to strive or aim to have perfect systems, rather than making them fail on purpose and designing them for a good failure. Like, whenever they fail, uh, to not destroy everything or make you lose your job or <laughs> whatever. So, design for failure, I have two things in mind. So, the first one is probability and the second time is again connectivity. I will go super fast on this because it's just like, I just want you to understand uh, some concepts before going to the actual important part of the topology of distributed systems. So, imagine, like, let's say that you have a modest distributed system which have like, a decent amount of users, but you are not Facebook, right? Or you are not Netflix. So you might say like, oh, it's fine. If it doesn't work, well, we, we can wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning or and just fix it. Or, oh my God, what are the odds that this will fail? Like, we don't even have that much users. Well, so the prob if the probability of something happening is one in 
however you say that number in English, <laughs> how often would that happen? So in real life, in terms of the reasoning and the internal dialogue that I just mentioned, that would say like never, right? It's like very, very odd. And in the rare case that it happens, we can fix it. But in physics, like this number is like all the time because you can go like at scale, like at scale, like from the classical physics up to the quantum physics where every single um, scenario or every single action happens and the probability of being just one is a possible probability. So uh, in the meantime, like whenever that probability happens or is possible, then it can happen, right? And then think about servers, right? So connectivity. Let's go real quick um, with the graph theory concepts. So uh, graph theory is the study of graphs, the mathematical structures used to model pairwise relations between objects. Two concepts, we have two concepts like nodes and, ver and vertices, lines, yeah, with er edges. And then uh, the graphs might be directed or indirected, right? I hope that everybody's familiar with this. And the very first paper that came out, out of this, at least the, the, the consensus is, like um, the Seven Bridges of Königsberg. Um, and well, you can look for it online. It's very popular. And this is important because I will tell you like in two minutes why. So um, you, the design of a system can be um, represented by a graph, right? With different nodes. Let's say this node will be our servers in Mexico and this node will be our service in Colombia, blah, 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 and then you connect them and that's it, right? So that's very basic. And well, it's a very useful uh, way to represent uh, and verify possible points of failure. Like if a node, like let's say, uh, if a node fails and you can graphically, like if you have like a system drawn in your blackboard or white, whiteboard, if you cancel or take a node out of it, you can visibly see what is going to happen with the rest of the nodes and the connections, and you can verify if those connections can be rearranged or if it's lost forever, et cetera. And, well, rearrange stuff. So, okay, so like this. So let's think at scale. Again, right? So with two nodes, uh, we have like a very simple graph, like one, two, communicate, A, B, Alice, Bob, etc. So, and as much as the graph complicates itself, like it's more complex as well, not only to describe it, but to describe the point of failure or, or what can go wrong. And even more difficult it is to be able to imagine different scenarios to rearrange failure. Well, in, in case of failure. So imagine like we have a real distributed system, like let's say Facebook or a bank in Colombia or a bank in Latin America. So uh, if we wanted to represent our system with graph theory, I mean, unless you're a very, very skilled graph theorist, nobody will be able to understand this, right? And, and then the perk of being able to describe a system in terms of graph theory will be a loss. So then what can we do? Well, the next step of graphical representation in this line of thought is topology, right? So this and this did not represent exactly the same, right? <laughs> it's not the same system, so. But let's, let's imagine it does, right? So like, I will go ahead and here uh, describe like this nodes, like for every like, triangle, we have different nodes, right? So each of these will be one of this, right? So the fact that they are in triangles means that they are like interconnected or that they have something to do with each other. So that means that, for example, if we cancel this node, then this node will have no connection with this and we have to figure out if it is critical or not, right? So 
by expressing our systems in terms of topological objects, we can have a lot of benefits if we're good at math. <laughs> so what is topology? Okay. So the study of geometric properties and spatial rel relations unaffected by the continuous change of shape or size of figures. That is like the formal definition. And the informal one is like the, um, whenever we make a change into a figure, it shouldn't have to change. Like for example, all of these figures are the same. They don't look the same, but they preserve the same connections. So as long as they preserve the same connections, they are the same topologically speaking, right? So, um, yeah. So the properties that remain invariant under continuous stretching and bending of the object, and for example, path connectivity, higher dimensional analog, uh, analogs, etc. Right? So here we have it again. I didn't repeat this slide on accident. Like the very first paper, the known paper published about topology is the very same about graph theory. So this is how things connect, right? So at this point, we just have like a mathematical background in whatever. So as I said, these are topologically identical objects. And then, well, a little bit of more context. Like, like again, the, all the nodes can be, think about it not in mathematical terms but uh, think about each node as a computer or as a server interconnected with, or users or whatever, like every single component of your distributed system, okay? <clears throat> Sorry. So combinatorial algebra or algebraic topology, that is what I was studying for my uh, postgraduate uh, studies. So, um, literally how, like the, como lo dice el nombre, <laughs> eh, tienes eh, la topología y luego los combinas, ¿no? Entonces, ja, ya, ya se acabó, no. Eh, <laughs> ese es el concepto, ¿no? Entonces, aquí vamos a ver cómo nos ayuda con todo el background que tenemos de, de lo que ya medio les expliqué. Obviamente ustedes pueden eh, investigar más por su cuenta, ¿no? Porque luego se quejan así como que, ay, es que el, las matemáticas por dummies, y no sé qué. O yo odio eso porque nadie es dummy, ¿no? Todo el mundo tiene que aprender. O sea, bueno, <risa> perdón. <risa> ok, so, combinatorial algebraic topology allows to have all the system perspectives of a node available at the same time. So, let's go back to our uh, graphs, right? So let's say that this node is connected to this one and this one, right? So it is very easy to see that, oh, and this one. So it is very easy to see that those are its only interconnections, right? But what happens in a system like this, right? So probably a node of those could be, like in the center, might be connected to one of this or whatever, right? But what happens, like if in a, solid or topological figure, like it has multiple interconnections and then at, at the time the other interconnection is interconnected to others. So you would have to study them separately and describe a very large um, graph. In topology, the normal topology, topology non-combinatorial topology, the only thing that simplifies is like the expression, but it is still the same problem. Like you only have access to a single view at a time. With combinatorial um, topology, uh, you have the benefit that you can explore all of the interconnections at the same time and have access like, is as if people were looking at this like classroom or whatever this is, like from, like from the top, right? That you have access, like you're like God or whatever. So, oh. Yeah, so it allows you to have all the perspectives at a time, and I will show you more, more figures to understand this better. So perspectives evolve with communication, right? So let's say that I will divide this place into two nodes and me and myself. So uh, in order to send a message to that node, for whatever reason, I needed to pass to this node first, 
right? So that, uh, from the topological perspective, will be described as like uh, node one to node two. And then that interconnection will, will change, right? Like it will be from node two to node three. And then, but that will mean, it, it will still mean that I have an interconnection with node three. Maybe not direct, but I have it. But if for some reason this node, all of you decide this is very boring and then go away, then I will still have to find a way to communicate with them. So in my super ugly example, I will still have a way to communicate with them, right? So even if you go away, I can reconfigure. So, uh, and this means like, for example, your servers and you all shut down because it was raining super badly. So I will still have a way to communicate with my other node, right? So this doesn't mean that it is not the same topological structure or the same system. It just looks different, right? Oh. Okay. So on the other hand, just aguantenme con lo que ya les dije y guárdenlo y ahorita lo vamos a usar otra vez, okay? Entonces, el, lo que sigue es que uh, cuando ustedes tienen un sistema distribuido, lo tienes que verificar, ¿no? eso sería lo ideal. And in, an, in an ideal world, you would have a distributed system and it, would, it, it should be verified, formally verified. What does this mean? Well, a lot of things that I won't explain right now, but that you can look for them on the internet. So it is very, very, very hard to get your distributed systems verified. CoreOS doesn't have verified systems, formally verified systems. Red Hat doesn't have formally verified systems that I know. But, <laughs> but for example, Amazon Web Services does have formally verified uh, distributed systems that have gone through all of the formal verification uh, that uh, uh, distributed systems should go through, right? So that is just like an example uh, for you to understand how rare and how difficult it is to have a formally distributed systems verified, a formally verified distributed system. Okay, so it is very hard to get because it is very expensive and it is very slow because it, it has to go through different stages like that nobody has the time to for or like or even like they don't have the expertise or yeah it would be very expensive in many terms right so only a few have this so yeah something someone said something okay so, <laughs> um yeah so the, for the formal uh, verifying of, of the of a distributed system you have to to check both definition and correctness um again and, and then there are many ways, like many uh, different ways to verify your distributed system. And the best way to do so is to combine different methods at the same time. So that is also another thing that you have to research by your own, on your own, but I just wanted to make you aware that that existed, right? So, um, for example, if it is so hard, then why are there so many successful distributed systems, Veronica? You're lying, right? I'm, I am not lying. The thing is that, uh, well, the first reason is that a lot of people don't know this. Like, they are not aware that you can formally verify your distributed system. Like, maybe some of you that I don't doubt that are super experts before knowing this, if I asked Alvaro, like, are, is RabbitMQ formally verified? And he would tell me, like, of course it is. <laughs> he would tell me, like, of course it is, because I'm very smart and I, I don't break anything and whatever. But no, I mean, I, I understand that he's very smart, but, like, it hasn't gone through all of the things that it has to go through. So, um, so, there is a very interesting paper. that is called an empirical study of the correctness, ETC, um, that that explains this. If you're very interested, like because this doesn't guarantee that if like if you you 
If you, si mandan su sistema distribuido <laughs> a verificar formalmente, it doesn't mean that it will pass all, or that it will be 100% bug free, right? So, but not as much as some verified ones. Like, it will still have bugs, it will still have incorrect things, but not as much, or it will be like in a different way. Okay, so how, so if there are many, many, many successful distributed systems nowadays, like, so how do they manage to work? How does um, uh, RabbitMQ or CoreOS or Red Hat manage to make money without uh, distributed systems that are formally verified or distributed systems that can fail at any point, right? So there are many things that you can do. Like, there, there are monitoring tools, observability tools, on-call engineers, uh, paging tools, mother testing approaches, chaos, chaos engineering. But back, so do you remember that I told you to keep this concept in your mind and it might not make sense? <laughs> well, let's go back to it. So, combinatorial topology could be used to help formally verify a distributed system through algebraic expressions, math again, right? So, but what does this mean? <laughs> okay, so representing our distributed systems as topological objects allows us to basically describe them and study its connections by sections or worlds, right? So let's say that I am very tiny for some reason, and the only thing I can see is you and their, your interconnections. But that doesn't mean that all that part of the classroom doesn't exist. So from a conventional perspective, I would just be able to see you or you at a time. From the combinatorial topology perspective, I would be able to see all of you at a time and, and see how you interact, right? So, uh, combinatorial topology gives you visibility, visibility of every partition. Placing together all of these views gives you that. Let's say that that figure is not just like the, the object of your nightmares, like in high school. No, it, that can be your distributed system expressed like in topological form. And well, this is just a frozen representation of all possible interleavings, interleavings, interconnections and interactions and whatever, and failure scenarios. Okay, so again, the concept of invariance. So if uh, for some reason you changed your servers from uh, Medellin to Bogota, like in terms of, of the topological space, it will still, it won't still look exactly the same, but it will be the same, okay? <clears throat> then uh, topological objects are subject to proofs, like mathematical proofs. <laughs> like if you express, if you decided to express this, that figure in like an algebraic equation, you would be able, well, <laughs> you should be able, to verify it by a mathematical proof, right? So our thesis, did, this is not, well, it is proof, but it, it is not wildly popular yet. Um, and I will show you the paper where my PI from the research proposes this. So um, our thesis is that once you express your distributed system, in terms of topological objects, you can then be able to express your distributed system in a, in a very large equation <laughs> or set of equations and then solve them and then prove them mathematically, like a theorem, right? So if you're able to do that and prove that your theorem is correct, then you would be able to verify your distributed system, formally verify it, and then save a lot of money, save a lot of resources, not resources as in people because, because I hate that word, but resources as in money, servers, time, processing time, computing, etc. So representing systems as theorems and proving them, yeah, verified systems, right? So there's a book about this that is, is written by two of the how, how do you say, thought leaders of this matter. And one of them was my PI and for my research. 
Um, and the other one, I don't know him, but I know his work. And he's very famous. And every, every single time that I talk about this, because I am like this old lady always like talking about like, you could describe this in topological form. <laughs> And then when someone recognizes that thought, they immediately think that I stole the idea from the, the other author of this book, whose name is Mar Maurice Herlihy. I hope that I am pronouncing it correctly. But no, I didn't steal anything. Like, his co-author was my PI. And well, here are some extra resources to understand better all of this. I know it was a lot of information that you might not be familiar with, or you might be familiar with, but you don't use like in your day to day. But here's like an invitation. If you were that person that was super extraordinarily good at math or at graph theory or at whatever it is, or you just have a lot of interest in these things, like there, there are good news. Like you will actually be able to implement them not only if you want to apply to Google and if they make you make like forms in, that you will never use again like in your interview. No, it's like you will actually be able to implement these kinds of things just in terms to, do, to describe your distributed system that makes money, right? So if I wanted or if I was allowed to <clears throat> in my company, I would be able to do this, right? I am not allowed yet, but, <laughs> but it can work. And I don't have the time for, to do it. But like, for example, the first uh, resource is uh, algebraic topology and distributed computing, a primer, which was written, co-written by the same people who wrote the book. And the topology of distributed adversaries, which is another book. <clears throat> if you are interested to acquire any of these papers or books, let me know. And well, uh, so just to sum it up, if you have a distributed system, the ideal thing to do will be to verify it by formal methods, but nobody has either the knowledge, the time, or the money to do it. Uh, our alternative that we propose is using math, math in the form of graph theory and topological spaces. If you are able to describe your distributed system in terms of topological spaces and then be able to express it in algebraic form and therefore be able to uh, prove it mathematically, then you would have a formally distributed system, a formally verified distributed system. And also, if that's the goal, but if that doesn't happen, just the very idea to be able to describe your system in terms of a topological space, even if it is not for, for the means to ver formally verify it, it, it will be very, very easy to see uh, to have like a broad view of all the interconnections and how if one of them goes wrong, how it will affect every single one of them. Just this, this approach might sound familiar with chaos theory and I am very, very uh, interested in that newish approach, especially since like I, this new company emerged called Gremlin that they focus on doing that. So imagine doing chaos engineering, being aware of all those interconnections at the same time. It will save a lot of time. But well, now I am ranting. Thank you very much. <laughs>